Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. It's David Horsager. I have one of my dearest friends on today. So there's a lot we could say about you, but first, please welcome Ross Bernstein. Hey, Orsi, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. I'm doing great. Great to see you virtually. We're going to see each other face to face again before long. But uh, just so everybody knows, Ross Bernstein is the (laughs) best selling author of almost 50. Get the other one written, would you? So it's 50. (laughs) Sports books, including, I've got a few of them here, if any of you are watching the video, The Champion's Code, Raising Stanley, Herb Brooks, uh, America's Coach, and a whole lot more. I love Brett Favre. I hate Brett Favre. Remember that? Uh, Anyway, we got some some good ones. I've got a a lot more of them on on my home library. But um, he has keynoted. He's a Hall of Fame speaker and has keynoted conferences on seven continents, even Antarctica. Not many people have done that. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, you know, he's been interviewed all over the world. He's been a part of the press. He's interviewed so many athletes. We're going to talk about a few of those from, you know, Pat Summit to Gretzky to Tom Brady today and, and others you've interviewed. How many, how many pro athletes, I mean, how many people have you interviewed in all this writing of books and being a part of the press and all that you've done studying champions? Uh, uh, it's thousands. I've been doing this since I was 21 years old. Unbelievable. <laughs> and back then, back when, back just after you were the, uh, didn't quite make the, the U of M hockey team and became the gopher. That's right. <laughs> A giant smelly rodent, Goldie the gopher. All right. Well, it's great to have you on. Tell us a couple more things about Ross Bernstein, and then we're going to dive in because you've got some great things to share. But what, what are some things we should know about Ross? Well, I'm a huge fan of Dave, Dave Horsager. That that's like, for, what else do you want to know? Like right there, that pretty much says everything, right? <laughs> oh my goodness! You know, like you said, I crazy story. My my dream was to play hockey at the University of Minnesota. Got got cut from the team. Became the mascot. Wrote a book about it called Gopher Hockey by the Hockey Gopher and launched my career. I had two two big brothers that had Ivy League MBAs and and I aspired to be a, a giant rodent. So uh, <laughs> mom and dad were so proud. But you know, I I, I just uh, like you, David. I just I kind of found my way doing something I love. But we all before we come become professional speakers, we all have a previous life and. My previous life was writing and publishing books, and and uh, and now, like you, I just get to speak all over the place and and try and help people. So I'm just I'm every day is sort of a new adventure, and 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 uh, I'm just grateful for our friendship, and I'm happy to be on visiting with you, and hopefully entertaining your your legion of listeners and fans all over the world. <laughs> well, I. I'm, I'm grateful to have you on. You've written a load of books. You've interviewed a load of champions. I, if I was going to say something that I think is really interesting about what you've done is you've, you know, you've built an amazing business yourself and, uh, and your family is just, uh, it's just so fun to see your marriage and your family and just the way you intentionally run life. And huh. um, that's, it's just Thank such you. a cool thing. You too. But, uh, but what I, uh, I, I think, something you share and I think you live it out is just all this wisdom of that you've learned from interviewing champions. And I think it'd be fun to jump right in. I think, you know, some of the books, you can see them here. We're going to put them in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. So you see at least several of our favorites of Ross Bernstein's books. But The Code, you wrote this series called, series called The Champion's Code, and you talk about it a lot. I've seen you speak, and we've been on some of the same stages. But um, if you were going to take some of the takeaways, I'm going to talk about some specific people in a moment, but just some key takeaways that jump to mind uh, as far as the champions you've interviewed, where would you start? Hmm. Well, my program, the, the Champions Code, it's really it's really about winning with integrity. So I, I wrote this series of books, as you mentioned, uh, these books called The Code about really they're about the unwritten, unspoken rules in sports. So in sports, as you know, because you were an all state wide receiver from Verndale mm-hmm. High School, Minnesota, <laughs> and then you played at nine man football. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just saying, man, I'm just saying, okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was all state for linebacker, by the way. I don't want to get too much credit because somebody will think I'm fast if you say all state wide receiver. Uh, 
Well, you you know as an athlete that that if you if you break the rules, there's consequences. So I wrote this series of books about you know what happens if you cheat or take shortcuts. Like in in hockey, if you you cheat, it leads to fighting. In in baseball, if you cheat, it leads to to getting drilled. Right. So so the program is really about winning the right way, and I try and translate that to business. As as a journalist, I love studying you know what makes the great ones great, and then translating that to great leadership and and customer experience and and dealing with with adversity. So for me, that's just kind of the angle that I do. But I, I love I love studying all all kinds of different athletes and coaches and then just figuring out what's unique about them. Let's take that. Let's what uh, let's talk about a couple great ones and we can go anywhere from here, but you did study the great one. He's become a friend of yours. He's written forwards in your books, but the great one Gretzky, the, you know, famous for skate where where the puck's going to be instead of where it is right now, but um you you've got a, you know, you've connected with them intimately in some of this work. What's something you learned from Wayne Gretzky? Well, I, I had a, a full-blown stage five man crush on him as a kid. I'm not going to lie to you. I, I had posters of Wayne all over my bedroom walls. And as a little kid, I was he was one of my heroes. And to get to know him later in life was pretty cool. Um, you know, when I talk about Wayne in my program, I don't, I don't talk about the obvious stuff, but I talk about how, you know, w- Wayne t- told me a great line one time about how you know, he, he's the NHL's all-time leader in goals. And he's the all-time leader in assists, but he had twice as many assists and goals. And when I asked him about that, he said that a goal made one guy happy, but an assist made two guys happy. And I just love that. And I love how it's just in his DNA to give and to serve. And, you know, Wayne, Wayne wore the C. And it was, it was, uh, it was the, the subject of one of my books about wearing the C and about what that means to be the captain, about how to lead and to lead by example. And that was really what what his demo is all about. And I, so I, I love, you know, kind of studying um, the weird little idiosyncrasies about, about champions and about what makes, you know, being a champion isn't necessarily about winning championships. It's just about the way you conduct yourself, the way you, the way you do business, the way you treat people. It's about relationship building. So he's just, you know, he's an amazing human being and uh, you know, he was an amazing hockey player, but he's, he's had equal success, you know, off the ice later in life as well. So it's someone I've been very proud to sort of get to know. And I'm, I'm still, still in awe of him. I think, uh, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, b- blow your horn so much, but it's just, this is something, if people don't know it, that everybody that knows Ross Bernstein, he lives <laughs> generosity. I was mm, yesterday, I took a look at the, one of the, one of the gifts you've given us, this massive, the biggest I've ever seen <laughs> Scrabble board that we, we had out. And it's like, or the time, you know, are invited to the, uh, you know, many you know, CEOs and Steve Wozniak, your friend, and, and many know is the, uh, uh, one of the um, founders of Apple, and 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 you invite us to this uh, amazing suite uh, event at the. Uh, um, I don't even remember the game because I was so into being together. Right, <laughs> it was a, wild, a wild hockey. game. Oh yeah, wild hockey game. Okay, yeah, but I fun. just, I, 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 there's so many ways you live that out. This, that's what I love about it is not just learning and writing about it, but you, uh, where you didn't quite make the U of M team. You live out all you've learned and all this other stuff. So I'm, I'm proud of that. I want to jump to somebody because you, you were one before she passed away that got to interview at the time who was the winningest basketball coach in the country, NCAA, uh, NCAA, University of Tennessee, women's coach, Pat, uh, Pat Summit. What did, what, what was that like as you think back on that interview and connecting with her? What were some of the things she brought a team? You know, we talk a lot, as you know, all about trust. How did she so consistently build these kind of high trust, high performing teams? Yeah, she was really a, a, an amazing coach. When I talk about Pat, I, I really um, it's it's a pretty cool vignette. But, you know, when I asked Pat about her legacy, she said she didn't want to be remembered so much for being a great coach, but rather for being a great teacher. And there's a big difference. You know, that's how she was able to connect and really build trust with with her with her students, student athletes was by not necessarily um, teaching, you know, coaching them how to be better basketball players, but how to be better human beings. And as a result, they were able to foster trust. And, you know, for Pat too, it wasn't about recruiting the best players is about recruiting the right players. And I really try and translate that to business as people think about their book of business as their clientele, as they think about hiring and keeping young Gen Z's and millennials to, to, to create buy-in. You know, old Pat was, 
was um, fire and brimstone, like a Vince Lombardi. She'd yell at you, scream at you. But, you know, as Pat got older and the kids got younger, she had to really change her tune and, and speak a new language, you know, social media, texting, young people today, it's not about, um, it's not about the money. It's more about culture and chemistry and being a part of an organization where they feel valued and respected. So, so you know, you'd still get that mile long stare if you screwed up, but then always a big hug and praise like, hey, I'm proud of you. You're doing a great job. And hey, I'm going to text you some YouTube videos some things you can work on. So constantly changing, evolving as a leader. Um, but really, you know, it's it stuck with me. You know, when Pat said it wasn't about the best players, it's about the right players. She said, you know, it's if it was the best players, then the Yankees would, would win it every year, right? Because they have the best players. They can afford the um, the top talent. and and and. Uh, but it really comes down to chemistry and coaching and these, these intangible qualities that were, you know, so important to Pat. So for her, it really, really came down to these other things. And that's how she was really able to uh, recruit the right kids for her system. And that, you know, she'd study them. She'd, she, she studied, she recruited kids as freshmen and sophomores, not juniors and seniors. And she'd, you know, she'd go to their, she recruited, you know, coaches, kids, who, you know, coaches, kids have a totally different DNA. She recruited farm kids like you, David, because they have incredible work ethic, you know, uh, dairy farm kids, you know, they're disciplined, you know, cows don't take days off as you know. And she loved recruiting those kids and, and uh, she studied them and she'd get to know their parents and grandparents and teachers and, and their friends, you know, people say people judge you by the friends you keep. So she wanted to get to know all these things. And, you know, over a lifetime of work, she was able to achieve amazing success through not a bunch of big things, but a bunch of little things. I wonder if what's translatable there to hiring, because, you know, when we, th we think of one of the biggest problems people have, it's, it's hiring, right? And, and in fact, a, a friend of mine that's a CEO said, with all these assessments, when I'm hiring a senior leader for my company, I get it with everything we got today, I get it right about 51% of the time. It's like, when you think about what, what, because somehow she, she hired right, in essence, you know, people that didn't even get to get paid right? They just got to be a part of a team. And from there, she built the culture. Do you, you know, what else, is there anything we can take away as far as businesses from, from how she in essence courted or hired people into the team? Well, interestingly, one of the things when I talk about Pat is I talk about how, you know, at the senior ceremony, when these kids graduated and they did, by the way, because Pat promised their parents that a lot of the kids would get the Lady Vols tattoo on their body at the senior ceremony. And then I equate that to a friend of ours, Chuck Runyon, the founder of Anytime Fitness, uh, who we've we've both worked at. And I talk about how, you know, Anytime Fitness, the, you know, the largest fitness chain in the world now, and approaching 5,000 franchise locations, how more than a third of their franchisee owner operators have the Anytime Fitness running band dude logo tattooed on their bicep or or calf. And, you know, just what did, what did, you know, how many, how many CEOs, how many people have their corporate logo tattooed in their body and what that means? We talk about rabid fans. I mean, you know, we both love the Minnesota Vikings. I mean, there, there are Vikings fans who have Vikings tattoos, right? But how many people would love their company or love what they do so much to put it on their body forever? So talk about, you know, building trust, building relationships, doing the right things. It's, it's those, series of little things that I think, and you know, that's, that's what I love to do is I love to, you know, translate things we can learn from sports, which is, which is my passion to business. And I, cause I think it's a universal language, whether I'm talking, you know, rugby in New Zealand or cricket in South Africa, uh, people speak that language as you know, because you go all over the world. So for me, I think it's just about connecting those dots. It's, it's, it's really fascinating. Hey everyone, a quick interruption here to share some big news. April 12th through the 14th, you are invited to the Trusted Leaders Summit. What makes a powerful event is bringing together amazing people in a way that actually makes an impact in the world. We're talking about a get together that is packed with immediately useful content. You'll hear from top leaders like John Foley, the former lead solo pilot for the Blue Angels, Harvard professor Alison Shapira, and more incredible global experts. Get your tickets before they're gone at trustedleadersummit.com and join us in becoming even more trusted leaders. We can't wait to see you there. Well, let's talk about another one that's real big today. Tom Brady is, uh, you know, big deal, and he's back to winning again. And, you know, he's, he's this... I mean, old many say and still performing. What have, you know? 
What do you learn from, how does he keep performing at such a high level, I guess? Well, from what I'll tell you, know? you I, I've never met a more competitive human being in my entire life than Tom Brady. I mean, that guy hates losing more than he loves winning. And at 44, which is pretty insane because these are like dog years in, in professional sports. The average professional athlete plays less than two seasons. What he's doing is, is, is incredible. But I'll tell you the thing that's interesting about Tom when I talk about Tom is I talk about consistency. I think Tom's greatest asset might be his short-term memory. You know, you throw an interception, forget about it. Have a bad play, have a bad series, have a bad game, have a bad week, forget about it. That's what separates the veterans from the rookies. The rookies obsess about failing and they can't get over it and they keep thinking about it. The great ones are able to process it, learn from it, move aside. And, you know, the thing that I've learned about Tom, you know, seven Super Bowls, he's the GOAT. No one else has come close. 11 conference championships. Here's a guy who got bored in New England, took a new challenge because he needed a, needed another challenge and went to Tampa Bay, a team that hadn't made the playoffs in two decades, changed the culture overnight, took less money in his own contract to be able to afford some of his buddies, and they won a Super Bowl. And it's it's unheard of. In a salary cap era, it will never happen again. He may repeat this year because he's just so committed. But what I've learned about Tom and I've learned about sports in general is that it's easy to get to the top, but it's really hard to stay at the top. But that's the essence of the dynasty mentality. And that's what Tom has. And that's what great companies have. So you and I get to work for some of the greatest brands in the world. And that's what you see. These companies, iconic companies that have been around for 50 years, 100 years, 150 years. And you look at how consistency, right? How that, do they stay what, consistent and be innovative? Because as yeah. you know, a lot of big ones died last year, right? Yeah. So how how do we, how in, in essence... How do they stay in um, consistently innovative? Like an IBM that's been around forever and changed, I think it when I r wrote about them was like seven times, but now I think it's like 11 major shifts that IBM, this, you know, with the, most companies, I think all the companies written about in the, the you know, good to great aren't even around anymore or performing yeah. very well, right? So how, what about these that, ha what's it take like to be both consistent and innovative? Yeah, I mean, I think consistency is really the price of admission for top producers. Like we all work hard. We all smile and dial and get in our cars and solve other people's problems to be successful. But I think innovation is really the key. And when I when I talk about consistency, one of the companies I love talking about is Levi Strauss, who I've done a lot of work with. You know, they're they're a 168-year-old company that that literally invented blue jeans. They invented denim because the gold miners were ripping their pants. And to see how they've reinvented themselves year after year, and even the last couple of years with, with, with global retail sales in the tank, they were up 10%. It's an iconic brand that didn't have the hubris to say, well, we've always done things that way. We invented jeans. They just keep reinventing themselves. And they keep, you know, they keep uh, just, you know, whether it's a, a, a women's uh, line or accessories or children's or an online strategy. Really, they, they even changed their whole brand to Living Levi's, right? It's and, and, and getting influencers like Taylor Swift and Beyonce to to brag about them and creating these new mediums. So um, they've just they've just done things very differently. And I, I love studying great companies that that are willing to to change things up and to really change. And you know, I, I think for you and I, David, I mean, it's. It's always been about change, right? I mean, when, when you know, people think of me and, you know, my college buddies and high school buddies think, oh, when I see them, they go, Ross, what are you working on? What work are you working on? That's not my, that's not my deal anymore. Like that was my previous life. Books, books died. Borders is gone. B. Dalton's is gone. Walden Books is gone. Crown Books is gone. Barnes & Noble recently acquired by a private equity group, whatever that means. But I can assure you they're selling more caramel macchiatos, board games, tchotchkes, greeting cards, and music than they do books. And now they've got these hideous things called eBooks, Kindles, Nooks. They're killing me. I write $25 books, but the e version is seven bucks. I can't compete with that. I got to do the same amount of work. I got to write it, edit it, market it, publish it, promote it, but I only make a fraction of the profit. Is that fair? No, but that's my reality. So I changed. So books became speeches. I've monetized my content differently. Books became became movies, done some documentary projects. My hockey fighting book was turned into a movie with an Academy Award winning director. Who to thunk? Books became speeches. So now my book, Wearing the Sea, 
if a client likes me, they can bring me back for something else. So I've just caught, you know, and, and for you and I, when COVID hit, we, we discovered this thing called Zoom, right? So it's constantly the change, the evolution. So companies that aren't willing to do that, companies with hubris to say, well, we own this category. As soon as something bad happens, they're gone. So it, it, it's, it's a fascinating concept to see who's, who's the quickest to adapt early, right? A lot of our colleagues as professional speakers um, didn't want to adapt and, and they're struggling, they're suffering, they're getting day jobs. So, you know, that's what I love about you, Horsey, is that you've, you know, you've, you've built this amazing brand. You're constantly changing and adapting. I, you know, Dave, for your listeners, Dave, and we, we've been friends for a long time and, and I, you know, you're one of the guys that I just, we, you know, we were in a mastermind 15 years ago and we were, you know, we both started out near the bottom to see your meteoric rise to how you've built an incredible business, you know, 10, 12, 15 employees at your, I've been to your offices. They're beautiful. And the fact that you've built this multi-million dollar juggernaut and you've got four beautiful kids and an amazing wife and you've really built a brand that's true to your ideals and ideologies that are very important to you, your faith, your family. Um, you've just had incredible success, David, and I'm so proud of you and I'm so proud to be your friend and you're so generous. You've, you've given so much to me, so many referrals and so much wisdom and and uh, you're just, you're one of the guys who's so respected in our business. And you, j I mean, for your listeners who don't, who don't know that about David, he's just in a, a he's just an awesome human. And uh, you, you know, you're constantly changing and adapting and, you know, whenever we talk, it's always, what are you doing? What, you know, we better for, cut I, this I, off or people are going to think I paid you yeah, or something. So. <laughs> well, it's funny, you, you know, you've built this big big brand. And whenever we talk, you always say, man, I wish I was like you with nothing. You know, I don't have any employees. <laughs> no, I, I don't say just, nothing. This is my worldwide headquarters. <laughs> as my mom likes to say, my basement, right? This is, you've got this incredible, you know, you're like, I wish it was easy like you're doing. And I look at you and I go, man, I wish I had all these fancy toys and all this stuff, but we're both oh, doing it. It's fun. But that that's the beauty of business, right? There's well, no one right way to do it. What, what, do you, what do you learn in these days? How are you staying, you know, you're not, when you're writing books, you, I mean, it just makes you stay fresh, relevant, capable. You're, you're, you're studying new people. You're, you're um, interviewing people. You're doing research. I mean, I, and you know that we're into research here and do, putting out this study every year, the Trust Outlook, and you know, staying fresh in certain ways. What do you do yourself to stay fresh these days? I, I, I mean, I know what, one of them is you're in a lot of companies. So you just learn from that CEO and that leader. Uh, you travel a ton. Boy, if people could just travel, uh, they'd learn a whole lot as far as opening their eyes and minds. But is there anything you're doing intentionally to kind of stay kind of fresh and yeah. relevant? Well, I, I tell you, the, the, the beauty for me with research is, is that I love it. I watch games every day. Every day I get to watch and read and study all the websites and watch all the games and obscure things and coaches and you go on, you know, and you hear their interviews and you're constantly learning. How did that coach make adjustments? Why did that team win? What, what was the backstory? You know, why, what was the motivation? What, oh, it came from a year ago when they disrespected them and did that. And I loved studying the game within the game that, at a higher level, right? That, that's what I love is when you really, it's like when you watch a game with a broadcaster, like a famous they're not watching the game. They're seeing it at a higher level. When I watch games with the professional athletes, you know, when we're, I'm friends with a lot of them, um, to watch them watch the game is just an experience in itself because they see such different things. So, you know, I'm always trying to add new content, new material, trying to, and, but, you know, big thing for my, my brand and my business is I try and take things that aren't your business and make them your business. So one of the new things for research that I've been doing, um, that I'm, sharing with my clients now when I'm speaking is I'm, I'm doing a whole vignette on hotels. I work a lot in the hotel or hospitality industry like you do, but I'm talking about the whole new category of millennial hotels. You know, hotels looked into their crystal ball and they said, you know, 10 years ago, like, whoa, you know, for our future customers, these Gen Z's and millennials, they like Airbnb. So there's a whole new category. Big brands, Marriott, Moxie, Radisson Red, Hilton True, Hyatt Centric, Curio, The Graduate. And I take people inside and I talk about the buildings, 
it's all about sustainability, recycled building materials. Um, I talk about, you know, the, the, the geothermal heat pumps and the solar and the wind power and the LGBTQ hiring component and the water catchment programs, things very important to young people that they listen to. And I walk them through every piece, you know, from the, you know, when you check in, there's an iPad, there's, you know, and, and they send your room key to your phone and then about the technology and, and how these places are wired up. And then you come into the lobby and it's about this shared experience, right? One side is old school, Sega Genesis, Atari, ping pong, foosball, but the other side's new school, drone racing, esports, social media, and talk about the food. It's all locally sourced, organically grown. The cows and pigs are treated very humanely. The uh, um, non-dairy, vegan, non-GMO, meatless meat, of course, you know, it's all part of what young people want, but young people don't have a lot of money. So there's a, 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 a grab and go section. Everything's maybe a dollar, but then if you get hungry later, you can text the robo butler. She'll drive it up to your room. It's very, very Instagrammable. You can head to the roof where they've got, you know, an apiary for their, for honey. And they've got, you know, a, a young people like food trucks. So they put a food truck on the roof. And, and then I'm sure you brought your dog because young people don't have children. They have animals. So they have a full service dog room service menu. So I talk <laughs> about all these things, right? And the local music and, and spin and vinyl and the artwork, it's all local, but it's about how they're reinventing themselves. And then I ask people. The hotel industry answered the bell. This isn't the future. They've looked into the crystal ball and this is how they're dealing with it. But what are you doing? How is your business? How are your listeners saying, how are people going to be buying mortgages and, and insurance and, and whatever widget or gadget that you're selling in five years and 10 years as these Gen Zs progress and they're become the, into, into middle management, right? So I think we're always researching and, and doing things. So even though I'm in sports, I'm always studying other industries and trying to relate that back. And I've seen that in that you've always that every client you work for, you really reach, research them to customize to them, right? So I what try. About your, I, like, like you, I try. It's hard, yeah. but I try. What's your business? Like, what about you? What about your, you know, you're you're doing a lot of speaking. We do, I, I tend to speak a lot out of the Institute. We do, you know, all these other things, consulting and measuring and whatever. But 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 we made a major pif, pivot in the bigger part of the company for us as far as the tech platform we built and all that kind of stuff to serve people well. What, what do you think the future for you, um, you know, even just like whether it's speaking or sharing your content, anything different you're going to be doing in well, five years? Well, you know, it's interesting because, you know, um, David and I are in a, in a, in a group of an organization we belong to called the National Speakers Association. And we're in a, we're in a, a top producer group. And, and it's interesting because th this year in Las Vegas, I was asked to be a presenter to talk about my business model because it's so weird. And, you know, one thing I'm doing is I'm not doing a lot of the things like I'm yeah. laser focused. I, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker. So I do about 120 events per year. But like, it's funny, the guy who contrasted me, our friend Verl Workman, who we yeah. both love, um, I took, he took a picture of one of my slides and I said, these are all the things I don't do. Like I don't consult. I don't coach. I don't train the trainer. I don't have an LMS learning management system. I don't, I don't have a list. I don't do social media. I don't have a weekly video series. I don't blog. I don't vlog. I don't podcast. I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. And Verl took a picture and said, and put it in his program. He said, these are all the things I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's so many bright, sparkly squirrel things we want to do. And sometimes I think saying no to things and just focusing on what you're really good at is uh, for me, I guess that's worked. I mean, certainly I pivoted to the point where I, I created a, an in-home studio, which I had to do during COVID. But other than that, man, I'm just, I'm grinding. I'm going and I'm I'm investing in, in me where I'm, you know, going to NSA events to learn to network. I, I have mastermind groups. You know, my, my greatest mastermind might be with you because we don't really have mastermind. We just call each other all the time and we're in our cars and we say, what are you doing, man? How's it going? How can I help you? What, what What's going on in your world? How's your family? And that's what I love. Just kind of old school, right? Picking up the phone and and just learning and and I so sometimes it's just not any one huge thing it's just a bunch of little things well let's let, let's take, take a quick pivot here to you you know a lot of the leaders especially those that I respect on the platform are leading themselves well in some way none of us perfectly but we actually care about whether it's faith family or fitness what are some things you're doing to lead yourself well I know you just ran another marathon how many marathons is that 10 10. And I haven't well, won any of them. I've come. <laughs> <laughs> you're a loser. You're a, you're a, I got the t-shirt. You're, you're a loser of marathons. I so, know. 
What, what, uh, but what are you doing daily? What kind of routines do you have, whether it's doing this research or health wise? I know your marriage is important too. What, what are you, yeah. what are you doing as far Thanks. as some consistent things? No, I, I appreciate you reaching out. Um, you know, obviously running, exercising, trying to eat right. I know you, you know, got healthy, really healthy several years ago and you've kept that weight off and you've really made a commitment to yourself and, and it's hard because you make sacrifices, right? And it's hard because we're on the road all the time and we, people aren't going to pity us for our first world problems, as they say, but it is hard. You go from airplanes to hotels to conference rooms and it's just a, 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 a craziness of food and drinks and things. So you have to make a lot of tough choices. So that's nice. One thing that's nice is, you know, Sarah, my wife, uh, we travel together. So we're on the road together. So we live on the road two, three weeks at a time and we love it. But so we try and hike and bike and run and make conscious decisions to eat healthier. And we try and look at stuff Look, like, Hey, what are we going to do? What's our game plan? Right. So you just doing that, I think is important, but you know, like, like accountability, you just, you're making calls, you're, you're trying to plan, you're trying to prepare and you're not perfect, but you know, it's just, we've all got challenges, but I, I just try and grind away like you do. And it's hard. We live in Minnesota where, you know, we're entering a really difficult phase. Like it's it come January, February, it's hard to live in Minnesota and be healthy. You're on the treadmill. You're not outside. You're it's dark at four o'clock. You, you know, you're it just, it's not an excuse. It's just hard. So you just got to make better choices. How long have you been? Like, I remember when we ran together in San Diego years ago and, and was in the, the same day you ran, we ran along the water. You, 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 you brought to your hotel room, I think, a 12 pack of Diet uh, Dr. Pepper, you know, to go with your run. Right. So but now you haven't had a Diet Dr. Pepper for three years. What do you yeah, what do you this is my new addiction. I, I there drink you go. sparkling water, right? Sparkling water with nothing in it. Any other habits like that that you've broken or kept new? Like I do this. I don't drink a Dr. Pepper. I do. Th I say yes to this and I say no to that. Anything kind of daily, especially on, you know, flights and traveling and, you know, it's hard. Like, you know, on flights, I'm, I'm not a real big drinker, so that's not a real big issue for me, but I try like my, my, my drink of choice on flights is, um, sparkling water with some cranberry juice and a lime. So that's what I'll get like on at sky lounges and, and stuff. And what, and another thing, you know, when I get, when I fly and I get to my destination, I'll have the Uber driver uh, or whoever stop at a convenience store. I'll try and map it out so that I can run in and grab some bananas or a 12 pack of sparkling water so that I'm not making poor choices or you know what I mean? It's just, it's hard. Like all these trade shows, it's like Halloween, you walk, they got candy all over and you know, you just, <laughs> you want to just grab stuff. So it's hard and I try and make, I try and schedule times to go run or, or, you know, we go hiking or playing hockey or, or, or golfing. I mean, I, I just try and do stuff, but it, I don't know. How about you? Have you, have you, have you made other things like that? I, I, I you know, as you know, I never, I, I almost never drink, drink a calorie. I, for six months, I didn't drink yeah. a calorie. I never drink a calorie on the plane. Um, I, but I do, you know, I'll, I'll have a, uh, some people might say, that's bad for you. It's got a Spartamine or Aspartame or whatever in, in Fresca. I'll have a Fresca because it does do my sweet, wait, my sweet tooth, but it has no calories. So, yeah. but that was a big jump from Coke, right? Back when I had, would drink a, a Coke or I, Diet see, Coke. I don't, so you drink coffee. I don't get any caffeine. People think I'm yeah. wired on caffeine, but the reality is good I don't enough. get any caffeine at all. So it's it's hard to sort of you know, but your body. I just read an actor. He was in the uh, oh, who is it? Wall Street Journal um, last week. This actor had stopped caffeine seven years ago, and he just doesn't regret it at all. And it's just uh, it was a, yeah. a cool story. Oh, everybody would know his name, but anyway. Um, I, I mean, so my, they're, 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 my, my two, I also my work out. I work out better on the road than I do at home. Oh, so that's good. I do not by habit. One thing I really try to do is I'm not in my hotel room. I, I use it as a place to sleep. So I'm either working with clients yeah, or because I think you just got a bed there. What do you, you know, you kind of so and I don't watch TV as a habit. I don't, you know, some of these things. So I basically if I, I, um, you know, not watching TV and not being in the hotel room that that helps. So I'm either doing a client thing or working out. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go work. I'll have some of my longest workouts. Now, usually like you, I'm in and out, in and out. Sometimes I might be in the library or a library just with Phil Jones out in New York and the hotel had an amazing library. I just love that. It's so inspiring. So I'll stop. I worked there for a few I hours. 
I saw Phil was going to be speaking at your big uh, Trust Edge leadership conference. And uh, I was out a couple months ago and, and Sarah and I took Phil and his wife out to lunch. We had a picnic in Central Park. In, yeah. Uh, oh, wow. Sheepshead Bay. So he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a rock star. And that guy's like 12 years old. It's unbelievable what that guy's doing. <laughs> We're going to give him this episode to put tell, show his kids, <laughs> right? Uh, no, he's, he, he's great. So he's uh, my, one of my international contingencies being from the UK, right? So yeah. um, anyway, uh, it's pretty fun. We got the Senate, Senate Majority Leader from the Republic of Kenya coming. And we got wow. some really... Really great cool. folks coming to the Trusted you Leader see Summit. How that's grown is mind boggling. Kudos, well, brother. That's amazing. Yeah. Let everybody know. I'm going to put a plug right now. Trustedleadersummit.com. It's yeah. going to be an amazing leadership summit. If you care about driving high performance with trust, be there. Anyway. And so, I'm just going to throw this in. I believe, Dave, you'll be giving everyone who attends a canned ham or an assortment of canned hams as, a, <laughs> as an added bonus gift. Just say it right now. Make it real. <laughs> right there, along with your Tesla. <laughs> My team once said, let's give away a Tesla for something, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, just because it starts with T like trust. But let's, boy, this is this this one has gone all over the grid. So uh, <laughs> let's, uh, any favorite advice you would give before I uh, leave with the with my favorite question of all? You know, I, I'm not a big wisdom guy. Just, you know, work hard, treat people right, and good things happen. I'm a believer in karma, right? Just don't charge for stuff. Give it away. And I believe if if you do good in the world, it's going to come back to you. I really believe in that. On that note, have Ross. He'll do it all for free. Free, free, free. <laughs> he just said it here. <laughs> hey, uh, where can we find out about Ross Bernstein? RossBernstein.com. Where's the number one place to find out about you? You just said it. I'm not shilling anything. I'm not hawking anything. I'm not a social media guy. I just, hey, I'm I'm on LinkedIn. So if you want to link on LinkedIn, let's link on LinkedIn. That's good. Okay. And RossBernstein.com and you'll find out about his speaking and books and, and all the other things he does. Hey, this has been a treat, Ross. Thanks so much for being on here. It's the Trust the Leader Show, as you know. Last question, who is a leader you trust and why? Uh, well, I'm going to go back to... Uh, one of my heroes, Herb Brooks. Uh, I'm the president of the Herb Brooks Foundation. Yeah, I've written a couple of books about Herbie. And um, he was just a real hero and mentor of mine. I met him as a 10-year-old kid at his hockey camp in 1980 after watching The Miracle on Ice, where I won the most improved award for the guy who sucks the most. <laughs> but we became friends later in life. And he asked me to write his book. And I got to work on it with him. I was golfing with him the morning he was killed in a car accident. So it's a big honor for me to be able to uh, keep his legacy alive and share his story. But uh, I really trusted Herbie. He was a, a hero, a mentor. Um, and I think, you know, Herb, Herb, it's interesting. Herb, Herb surrounded himself with people that he felt were smarter than him. And uh, he, 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 uh, he just really, if, if he wanted to learn something, he would just surround himself with people that he had admired and respected and he would learn. And as famous as a guy he was, he just was constantly learning and, and changing and adapting. And, and I could go on and on about Herbie, but he was a guy I really looked up to. And I'm feeling very proud to keep his legacy alive through our charitable foundation where we've raised millions to help kids. And, and uh, that's, that's uh, something I'm very proud of. Awesome. Herb Brooks. One of his books right here that Ross wrote, America's Coach. I showed it in the camera, but if you're just listening, it's called America's Coach by Ross Bernstein and forwards from some of the folks on the Miracle and, Miracle and Ice team, 1980 gold medal team. So, Ross, it has been a treat. This has been the Trusted Leader Show, everybody. Until next time, stay trusted.